My brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is uh, for them, for their salvation. He's talking about to the Romans, the people who don't believe in God. For I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. They're jumping up and down for the Lord, but they don't know anything about it. Sounds familiar today, doesn't it? A lot of churches jumping up and down, and they say, well, what about God? What about Jesus? What about this? And they go, I don't know. But not for knowledge. For knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the true righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who would believe. Even Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law should live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's written upon your heart. This is the word of faith of which we are preaching. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God truly raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth man confesses, resulting in his salvation. For the scriptures have said, whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. And in this faith, there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for anyone who would call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then shall we call upon them in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's me, guys. And how shall they preach if they are not sent? For it is also written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the glad tidings of great things. However, they did not heed, they did not all heed the glad tidings when they came. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed in our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? For indeed they have. The voice, has, the voice of the Lord, this is the psalm he's quoting. The voice has gone out into all the earth and his words to the very end of the world. But I say, surely Israel does not know, do they? At the first, Moses said, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I shall anger you. And Isaiah was very bold when he said, I was found by those who sought me not, and I became manifest to those who never asked for me. But as for Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands, to a disobedient and obstinate people. Well, you know, how great and beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings, but even those who bring glad tidings sometimes don't want to hear it. You know what the hardest part of being a Christian or getting someone to turn to Christianity is? Come on, I've told you this before. Exactly. Establishing a need. Christianity will never take root without the seed. And we all say, well, the seed's the word of God. No. The seed that we plant or need to plant in the people are the need for the word of God. Let's face it. If you have a big breakfast, you're not going to want anything to eat, right? If you have a big lunch, you're not hungry. You're not going to go to the burger world, are you? If you have a huge dinner and then people come out with this giant cake and say, here, I'm going to give you a giant cake. What are you going to say? No, thanks. I don't, I can't, I can't t eat another bite. How many times have you said that? I'll have it tomorrow or whatever. 
even our basic primal physical interests are based on need. When your hair is all scraggly and sticking out everywhere, what do you say to yourself? I need a haircut. My wife says, I'm going to go have my hair done. No, you're going to go have your hair worked on. Because your hair will never be done. It hasn't been in 44 years. I would wish it was done and we'd be done with it. You're going to go have your hair worked on. Well, Christianity, this is a stupid example, but Christianity is a lot like that. Ah, T, what? In Christianity, I am going to liken unto the goal of every life, and that is what? O N S H I P. A relationship, a true relationship with God. God plus me. This is the goal of every life, right here. Doesn't matter whether you become a doctor or a surgeon or a teacher or a professor or a garbage collector. God doesn't care about any of that stuff. He'll let you be whatever you want to be. But what he wants you to be is in a relationship with him. That's the goal of every life, every soul that ever takes a breath on this planet. But that won't happen unless there is perceived or sensed a need for it. Oh, what I gotta go to church and believe in all this Jesus stuff. You ever heard that before? I hear it all the time. 99.9% .9 of the people in the world tell me that, Tanner. I don't want to go to church, a bunch of hypocrites. And they start making excuses why they don't want to go. And I'm saying, you know, that's all satisfying your conscience. But the fact of the matter is, God's concern still remains. He wants you to be a believer, not an unbeliever. And you'll never establish that, as we already discussed in the earlier chapter, by the law. The law, in no way, shape, or form, can establish this relationship. That just The law reduces God to a bunch of rules and regulations. Don't eat this, don't drink that, don't do this, don't do that, you know, don't work on Sunday, don't do this. Don't. God is much more than just a bunch of do's and don'ts. He is much more than just a bunch of... That's like mom. Now, moms do a lot. When you, when you boys were younger, Racha did a lot of that. No, don't stick your finger in that wall socket. Now, don't put your hand on the stove. Don't put your... But what, why was she saying all that stuff? Merely to protect you and get you into adult, a young adulthood where you can decide for yourself, uh, are you going to keep living by mom's little do's and don'ts or are you going to see mom for who she is, the woman who loved you enough to protect you from yourself. Now that you see her for all she is, mom is no longer a bunch of do's and don'ts. Who does mom become? Mom. Right up there with God almost. <laughs> Sometimes even I'm a little more real than God because she's mom. And if you don't believe that, wait till the day when you hear it. Not that you guys have ever heard it. But there are moms who say, why do I got to do that? Because I said so. <laughs> you ever heard a mom say that, boys? Never said that. I don't know how it sounds in Racha, but I do know that they say it. <laughs> I want you to do this. Why, mom? Because I said so. If that ain't God-like, I don't know. <laughs> the only thing is God's got a book written after him. Mom doesn't. But she wields the same, the same kind of power. Do you need a mom? There are kids around the world starving to death who never had a mom and wish they did. There are kids lined up in the orphanages waiting for just one mom. I told you about that new song, or country song. I was about crying at the stoplight when I heard it. I'd never heard it before. It came on. It's called A Christmas Carol. And it's about a little orphan girl. And she goes to see Santa in the store. And the Santa puts her on her knee and says, well, what do you want for Christmas? And the, then the chorus of the song is what kills you. It says, well, my name is Christmas Carol. I was born on Christmas Day. I never who, knew who my father, who my daddy was. And my mommy ran away. So all I want is a mommy and daddy to take me to their home. A mommy and daddy who wants a Christmas Carol of their own. And, you know, you're going, oh, God, give me a break. 
Well, if you listen to the rest of the song, the Santa goes home and he and his wife could never have kids and he was all tore up about it and he told about the little girl. Of course, then they go down to the orphanage and do all this and they ask him to bring her back to Santa and so they take her back to Santa and then Santa takes her home. I mean, it's just, you're sitting at the stoplight crying your eyes out of this stupid song. That little girl knew she needed them all. It's amazing. Even the youngest and tiniest little children know something's missing in their lives. They need a mom, they need a dad. They... Well, if we can plant that same kind of need in the minds of the unbeliever, that would lead to a relationship with God. And I'm not talking about just saving souls. All right, God, that's another one I got. There's another one I got. There's another one I got. That's not Christianity, and that certainly isn't ministry. This is not ministry. I built five buildings. I got 3,000 members. I got $10 million. That's not ministry. You know what ministry is? Getting somebody to see this who eventually acts on it and becomes a lover of God. Sometimes that takes 30 years. Sometimes that takes a betting on the, on the dolphins and the jets. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know who I'm talking about. But it did take a long, long time. And who do you see in church every Sunday right there? And I can name a bunch of folks just like that. Paul knows this. This is what chapter 10 is all about. He says, how can you believe, in, you know, belief or developing this relationship, faith, what God says, you can't see God without faith, you can't enter heaven without faith, you can't please God without faith, you can't do anything without faith, right? What's the first step of faith? Learn. Learning. Knowing about who? God and who else? Yourself. The not God. <laughs> yeah, the not God. He is the great I am. And you are the great I ain't. <laughs> and as long as you're the I ain't, you might figure it out that it would be a better match if the I am and the I ain't got on the same page. That's, a, that's Christianity in a nutshell, boys and girls. Does that happen overnight? Hardly. How long does it have, take to, to develop a true relationship with God? I don't know. How many meals have you eaten in your life, Benny? Do you remember what you had 33 years ago for lunch on Sunday? I don't remember. March 17th? <laughs> well, the, which one of the meals got you to your 88 years or whatever? Which one of your meals got you? Well, you say, Tom, you're being an idiot. Of course I'm an idiot. That's when I am. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, all of the meals got you here. From the first time you came out to the... Now at 88, you're probably going to go to the magic mushroom over here. And... You just promoted me one year. It's back up one year. 88? Oh, no. you're 87. <laughs> Who cares? It's, you know, it's all relative. Now you're like this far from God. Just enjoy it. The point is, you're going to go to the magic mushroom over here and get a pizza today. And why is that pizza any more important than the first... I don't know, baby food your mom gave you when you were two. No. No. That kept you alive then. This keeps you alive now. It's a long, long, there's a whole lot of investment in this thing called Ben. Same thing with Tom. Probably a little more investment in Tom. <laughs> the point is, it takes a lifetime. Well, folks, <coughs> same is true in a good relationship. It takes a lifetime. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the sermon today when we look into that manger and find out the message that God has from the manger. Message from the manger is the title of the sermon. Clever, huh? I just don't know how I do it. I keep coming up with this stuff. Anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about relationship. And how long does it take? Well, when can you stop being a Christian, man? Better not. When you breathe your last. The psalmist says quite plainly, as long as you have breath, you have the ability, in fact, you have the duty to praise God. 
as long as you have breath. So when that breath stops, okay, you can have a day off. Well, then boom, you're into heaven. <laughs> and then you've got to start praising God again. So I don't know about the day off. But on this planet, and that's the only thing I can reference, boys and girls, because that's the only thing I know. Faith is something that you do the rest of your life. And I often liken it unto a doctor. You know, a kid goes to school to learn about uh, the doctor, to be in a doctor, and then eventually as he's learning, sometime along the way, they say, well, you've got to practice it. You've got to try and do the surgery. You've learned how to do the surgery. Now you've got to do the surgery. And now you're learning and attempting to not kill people. And then eventually, as you get better and better as a surgeon, what do you got to keep doing? You got to keep learning and learning and surgery and, and then you begin to train others how to be a surgeon. Oh, he's the greatest doctor in the world and he's going to teach you guys how to do it. Well, this is Jesus. Abide in my word and let my word abide in you. Learn about me. Love one another as my word has taught you. Love one another as I've taught you. Practice what you learn. And finally, what? Bear good fruit. Teach others how to love me. And so, what does this do? John chapter 15. And so, prove you're my disciples. Prove to me. Don't tell me you love me. Don't tell me you believe in me. Don't tell everybody says, oh yeah, there's God. Well, do you have a relationship with him? Do you go to church every Sunday? Do you pray to him? Do you meditate? Do you sing hymns? Do you care for one another in church? Well, no, I am not time for all that stuff. Well, folks, Christianity is all that stuff. It's all that stuff. But it all comes back to here. Yes, beautiful are the feet. Wow. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news about Christ. But you know what? If they're not interested, how beautiful are those feet? Well, they're still beautiful, but nobody cares. If I bring out a beautiful, giant, lovely, gooey cake and say, Benny! You say, well, Tom, I just came from Outback Steakhouse. I had a huge steak and I baked potatoes and everything. I don't want the cake. The cake is still beautiful, isn't it? The feet that brought the cake are still beautiful, isn't it? But what's the problem? You don't need it. You don't need it. <laughs> and therefore, things that we don't need, we generally don't seek after and we don't want. It. And Moses said it best, Lord, I'm talking to an obstinate people. Lord, I'm talking to people who saw the ten plagues who saw miracle after miracle, who saw your pillar of fire at night to keep us warm in the desert, who saw your pillar of clouds in the daytime to keep us cool and shaded from the desert sun. We're talking to people who you talked to the rock and a river gushed out all over the place in the middle of a desert where there's no water. Water was like a river, Moses said. Came out of the river. You're talking about the same people that saw the Nile turn to blood, the animals die, the vegetation die, the locusts eat everything, fire from heaven, the hail of fire, the death of the firstborns. I mean, come on. Ten times, God said, how much is it going to take? You know, people say, well, if we had miracles like that, I believe. No, you didn't. What does Jesus say in the Gospels? We sang a celebration and you would not dance. We mourned with a dirge and you would not pray. What's it going to take for you to believe? Remember? Jesus got a little cocky. He was talking to the priests, by the way, at that time. Not just the people, but to those who were supposed to know about God. We've, I've done everything from A to Z. And you still won't listen. Well, we don't need a Savior. We don't need a Messiah. 
but you've been waiting for it for 3,000 years. We don't need a Messiah. We got our do's and don'ts. And more importantly, we get to judge people who don't abide by our do's and don'ts. We determine who will see God and who won't see God. We determine who will go to heaven and who won't go to heaven. We are the dispensers, the spigots, if you will, of God's grace and mercy and blessing. And if you have enough money, we'll give you a shot at some of that. Or if you have enough property, we'll give you a shot at some of that. See what I'm saying? And the Lord came and said, you know what, I'm trying to teach you We've sung, not sang, that's Southern, sorry. I was S-U-N-G song. Anyway, I like saying better because <laughs> when you're born and raised in the South, that's it. You sang, you bank, you <laughs> all that stuff. You're fixing. You know, us Southerners, well, we're fixing to bleed. Well, you better get on with it and stop fixing because that moment's going to pass. God said, I've done everything I can to help you understand. Walk with me as the day is still here because soon the time is coming when the light's going to be gone. And you're going to have nothing. Well, we got our law. Tonight's Hanukkah. That is the holiest time, one of the holiest times of the, of the Jewish year. Do you remember what Hanukkah was all about? Hanukkah to the Jew is like 4th of July to us. It's when they won their Judas Maccabeus, got all his Jew guys together, what was left of them. And they went up against two armies, actually. They went up against the Seleucids in the north, who were the son, great, great, great grandsons of the Babylonians. And they went against the Ptolemies in the south, who decided to come up, and they decided to come around, and unfortunately, Israel was their battleground. And they destroyed Israel and killed many of the people and took everything they had and raped the land, literally. And a little snot-nosed kid that was never going to, you'll never amount to anything. Judas Maccabeus said, you know, I've had it. He believed in God. He had a relationship with God. He said, Don, enough. When is it going to stop? And accordingly, he had a vision. God told him, grab up whoever you got left and let's have some fun. So Judas Maccabeus gathered his army and he went out against the mighty Seleucids and Ptolemies. And if you remember, they got clobbered. And they all retreated back to Jerusalem, their final fortress, their final foothold. And the Lord said, I want you to go in the, into the temple and pray. And they realized they only had a little bit of oil left. And it wasn't enough to light the temple candle, the menorahs, which stood for life in the Jewish mind. Candles of life. And they lit it, and lo and behold, it burned for eight days until the Jews were victorious and rid the country of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. They both went back in defeat, destroyed, and God's candles were still burning from that. You know, bottle cap of oil they put in the oil. And it was a miracle. Once again, God said, Here I am. This is what I've done. Now, you decide. What do you think? Are you going to need me? Are you going to believe in me? Do you even want to be with me at all? That's the second or the maturing of faith is when we know, we see it as worthy, and we commit ourselves to live to the Lord. This is the mature faith that John speaks of, that Paul speaks of, uh, Peter speaks of. Faith without works, that's James. Faith without works is what? It's dead, it's worthless. It's nothing more than a bunch of knowledge. I have a bunch of knowledge about World War II aircraft. Why? Well, because my dad flew them, my uncle flew them. Uh, my other uncle flew them. I built a hundred models when I was a child about them. In fact, I got one in my office right now under construction of the B-17. And my father flew those. They're incredible planes, and I know a lot about them. 
I know everything about them, but you know what? I've never flown one. I've never shot machine guns. I've never bombed the city. My father did that every day. Got up at 6 in the morning, was in his plane and taking off and heading for Germany for four years. I've never flown one, so does that make me a B-17 pilot? No. Does that make me a good soldier or, or airman, a fighter, a hero? No. Now, about four or five years ago, Carol had to go to Palm Springs for a conference out there with her company, and I went with her because I'd never been to Palm Springs. So they went into the conference, and it was all day, every day for like three days. I was boring. So I got in our rent car and I went driving around Palm Springs. You know what's around Palm Springs? Nothing. It's in the middle of the desert. Here's a big old desert. Here's Palm Springs. You got some millionaire homes there and you got some celebrities there and you got a couple of convention centers there, but you know, and there's that kind of stuff. I guess a little escape from California, the nut, nut house over here. But you know what's around Palm Springs? Nothing. So I was driving around Palm Springs trying to find something to do, and you know what I found? Nothing. And there was a tiny little airport out here, and I said, well, why do they need an airport? And it was an airport for the, the aircraft of history. Now, well, that sounds cool. So I drove into the airport for the aircraft of history, and it was just that. It was all the old World War II planes, and even World War I planes that I had read about and studied about, like Dad knew. And you know what they had there? A B-17. And for $90, I could go for a plane ride in that B-17. For $90, I said, oh. I gave them 90 bucks. And two guys got in that plane, and they cranked up those engines. First one. Fire on two! I could only imagine my dad doing this. 23 years old, every day, every morning, he got up. Fire on three! And then, let me tell you that plane doesn't have shot. And this took off on a paved runway. They used to land on the grass in Grafton Underwood in England. So you can imagine what that was like. They strapped themselves in just to keep staying in their seats. And that thing took off. It was roaring and straining. And I said, oh, we're going to die for sure. Loud? Yes. No wonder they all wore those things on their ears. Those engines are so loud and there's four of them. And I got to go around the plane and climb up in the ball and shoot the machine gun. I shot down about 15 planes that day. Actually none, but in my mind I was shooting them down. And down in the ball gun, I shot like 15 submarines. And then in the tail gun, you climb all the way back to the tail. Side gunners, wow, chin gunners, and then I got to sit in the bombardier's chair. Right in the nose, you ever the 17? It's all glass. You're sitting on glass. Everybody else is in the metal part of the plane. And you look in the thing and go, dang, we're really up here, aren't we? How cool was that? Well, for me, it was great. You know why? Because nobody was shooting back at me. <laughs> I had an easy Christianity that day. See, it is not that easy. A lot of times, the minute you profess Jesus Christ, you're shot at. For every one person that celebrates your Christianity, there'll be 20 that hates it. There'll be a lot more people that don't think it's cool than think it's cool. And not to beleaguer the illustration, but... My old man lost a lot of men and three planes. He, he was shot down three times. And you know what he did? He got back to Grafton Underwood and they put him in the fourth plane and said, go. I would think after one shot down, you'd call it quits. No. Two, three. Got 
plenty of planes, but they, were, they didn't have pilots. They didn't have men. That's a true story, folks. I've always thought about that. And I know everything about 17s, but I've never flown one. I've flown in one now. I can say that. I've never flown one. My dad was 23 years old, climbed in that cockpit with nine other men every day for four years and took off knowing full well every time they probably, or good chance they won't come back. They'll either be killed in the air, killed in the crash, or take, if they get out, they'll be taken prisoner by the German army, which a lot of men were. Send out 36 planes and seven come back. Send out 1,200 planes and only 52 come back. One squadron, they weren't squadrons of 36. One squadron, 36 planes, and they call it the ghost squadron. They never came back, none of them. Well, I'm not saying Christianity is that rough, but it can be. That's what we talked about last chapter. And that's why uh, Paul is saying to the Romans, if you establish a need, a need, then you got a better shot at teaching and establishing a relationship. And this relationship is what's going to get the job done. When you can get up every morning and climb into that cockpit. Now, we have all love the verse, this is the day the Lord hath made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, we love that, don't we? How many people actually do that? Oh, sure, I know about God. 99% of America confesses some kind of greater power or God. But how many of them are in church? Less than 3%. We're a nation of 400 million people. 3% of 400 million? That's not a lot, folks. Not a lot. So the bars are full. The theaters with nasty movies are full. And the churches are empty. Now, fortunately, this week, our churches will fill up a little bit. <laughs> Two weeks a year, we enjoy a good audience. Let's listen to Easter. Why? Well, these are the just-in-casers. Not really in a relationship with God, but just in case. I better go for an hour on Christmas Eve, and I'll bet you dollars to donuts, half of them that come on Christmas Eve that don't normally come, will be half in the bag already. And you go, well, Tom, why do you allow that? Well, because I've got a shot to plant some seeds. And I'm going to take it. And if they're half drunk, well, I'm still going to preach. That doesn't relieve me of my job. So we went out to sow seeds. Some of it fell on good ground, some of it fell on not so good ground. But the sower was obedient, the seed was good, the soil not so much. But the few seeds hit the good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. All depends on your relationship with God. I love Sister Tree, some other trees. Don't you get so depressed having a ministry with where you never see any success? Heads of state said that to her. And she said, God didn't call me to a ministry of success. He called me to a ministry of service. In the same love that he taught me. Where's my love sign? Oop, I don't have it up there. In the same love that he taught me. How many country songs you heard about mom and, so, and dad? Let me tell you about a father's love. It's just not when you're good and successful, it's all the time. Let me tell you about a mother's love. Sister Teresa knew that. Because she had a relationship with God. Paul tells us that's our goal. But the problem is, I don't want to hear it. You're bringing a beautiful big old fat gooey cake and they've already filled themselves with everything else in the world and you get don't get depressed when they say I don't want any cake don't get depressed 
Jesus got a little rougher. He says, well, shake off the dust of your sandals and take the cake next door. <laughs> well, the truth. Got to remember, he was the sower. He just didn't sow in one field. He threw them everywhere. Here's your goal as a Christian. As a Christian in a relationship with God, your goal is this. Twofold. First, to keep this need alive in your life. Be, be glad God gave you a ministry of service, not necessarily a ministry of success. And secondly then, to try and plant those seeds in the lives of others. That's Christianity in a nutshell. I don't care how many denominational quotes and laws and rules you can quote me. That doesn't make any difference. Need in your heart, in your mind, keep this relationship strong regardless of success or failure. Need in the faith in the lives of those around you. Because if you can plant the need or the seed, eventually it might take root. Sometimes it takes 30 years. It can grow. A little lady sits on the back of my church every Sunday. I worked on her for 10 years. Then I just lost touch with her. And a little while ago, about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, she walked into church one Sunday. I was back there talking to somebody. She walked in and tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around. And my human response, my first response was, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> she goes, that's no way to greet a new, a new person in your church. I said, I worked on you for 10 years. She goes, well, I'm here now. I said, all right, sit down and let's get holy. She's been there ever since. She's still back there. She's still as mean as ever. But you know what? I think she got this. I think she did. That's Christianity, folks. In fact, I don't even like to use this word. I like to use this word. Do you know Jesus? 99% of people say, sure. Do you live for Jesus? <laughs> That's the, do you go to church? Do you love others as he taught you to love? <clears throat> that ain't Christianity. I'd really use this word. Do you have a relationship with God? Is he important to you every day when you wake up? like the woman next to you or the man next to you that you call husband and wife. No accident Jesus used that imagery. The bride and the bride. No accident at all. And that's the most intimate relationship that we as physical creatures know on this planet. I know we've got friends with our guys in the team and the girlfriends and sister friends. And nothing is deeper than the bride and the bride. That's everything. You're vulnerable. He's vulnerable. And you're both glad to be there. I've never known a bride or a groom on their wedding night who weren't glad to be there. That's what Jesus wants. That's what God wants. That's what the world should want. <clears throat> and Paul says, don't be surprised if they say no thanks. Moses had the same problem. He often went to the Lord and said, these people are stupid, they're obstinate, they're stubborn. And God says, what do you tell them here, Moses? Be specific, will you? I gave them ten plagues and they didn't believe it. I gave them water in the desert and they didn't believe it. I gave them everything and they didn't believe it. Welcome to, welcome to God's world. All right? Chapter 9, Paul wants, or chapter 10, Paul wants you to know, don't be discouraged. You're not called to a relationship of success. You're called to a ministry of serving. All right? That's all I got. Go away.